everybody, welcome. Today what I want to talk about is ignition systems and how they work. So you're looking at a distributor style ignition system. This one is rather uh, special to its era. It uh, used a mechanical switch inside of, it, of a distributor called a, a breaker point. We're gonna look at that in a moment and what that little switch did internally as the distributor rotated inside was triggered an ignition coil which then sent high voltage power of about 20,000 volts down to the middle of a distributor cap. Internally, if we looked in the distributor cap, we had a rotor and that rotor was driven by the distributor shaft which was driven by the camshaft. And as that rotor turned, it would send power from the center terminal that was collected at a carbon button in the middle of the distributor. And as it lined up with specific terminals, a special switch called a breaker point switch would trigger that ignition coil to, to release its spark and send it to the spark plugs. So that's how cars used to work. We're gonna get into more detail a little bit about how these guys exactly create the spark in this special transformer called an ignition coil. And that's right, cars today that have ignition coils, and they all do, have a transformer. Steps up voltage from about 12 to a voltage of nearly 100,000 volts on some modern cars. So voltage has climbed up a long ways since the first ignition systems to where we operate today. Okay, I've got a distributor that's old school here and I'm gonna look at some of the internal parts with you on it. So there's the rotor I'm taking off, and we talked about that a moment ago. And you can see the little spring button on the end that makes contact with the distributor cap, and also the end of the rotor that's gonna take that charge from the, from the coil and get it over to the spark plug terminals that run down to individual spark plugs through the wires. Now, if you look into the distributor, on old distributors, you're gonna see that they had a little switch in there and you can see when I rotate it, that switch is gonna open and close. You see that right in there? Just watch that point, I'll get nice and close. You can see that switch opening and closing. Every time it comes by a lobe there, there's a little rubbing block right underneath that switch point there where it makes contact with what we call the distributor cam lobes. And every time that little breaker point opens and closes, it's gonna fire the spark plug. Now in between the lobes right there, we have what they call dwell time. That's the amount of degrees that that distributor shaft rotates before it triggers the coil again. And we used to be able to measure that with a special meter called a dwell meter. Now, this is a four cylinder distributor. You can see four lobes on it. Now what's missing on this one is something was called a condenser. There's a little round, little, uh, just a little round device in there that basically absorbed the high voltage spikes that came to the point so they wouldn't burn out as quickly. We'd, and these old distributors, every 16,000 kilometers, about 10,000 miles, we'd end up having to replace it because the amount of arcing that would occur in there over time would wear the breaker point so, and it would no longer make contact. And the other thing that happened is that little rubbing block that rubbed against the nose of that cam over there over time would wear out too, and we'd lose the amount of gap on there, and our spark would break down an ignition coil. We'd end up with misfire, and eventually the car would stall and not run anymore. So maintenance was really important. We don't have to do that anymore because today's cars have changed to a little different device. But uh, we had a, we'd use a filler gauge on that. We put a filler gauge in that little gap. We'd loosen these two screws right over here, and we'd we click the engine over. We'd bump the ignition until we hit the peak of the cam lobe there. And then we'd come along with a feeler gauge and we'd insert it between those two points and we'd set the gap by adjusting, loosening those little screws and moving that little side of the plate on the breaker point and retightening it down. Usually they were gapped to about, oh, 12 to about 15 thousandths of an inch, depending on the cars. And then what we'd do is put the rotor back on We'd obviously put a little bit of grease on there, just a slight amount. We didn't want to put too much, but we put a slight amount to lubricate the, the rubbing block on the point. We'd put it back together and we'd send the car off down the road. Now, we used to do something called ignition timing pretty regular. We'd adjust the, uh, when the spark would occur and we could actually loosen the distributor, rotate it one way or the other with a special timing light that focused on the timing marks on the crankshaft and we do that as part of the tune-up procedure. 
Now, distributors for many years as well had special devices on the side. They look like this. They're called vacuum advances. When we have a low load on the motor, we are able to advance the ignition timing a little bit, make it occur a little bit earlier so we get complete combustion in the cylinder. When we put load on the engine, what happens is we open the throttle plates and the vacuum in the intake manifold will drop down. Put a vacuum hose right here, there's a diaphragm in here, runs down to the intake manifold and it's able to sense the intake manifold vacuum signal. In high vacuum, we have more advance. When we have a low vacuum, that means engine under load, we want to back the timing off so we don't end up with pre-ignition. Now I'm going to put a vacuum pump on this and pump it up and you can watch what happens to this, to this breaker point plate. It'll change its position relative to the rotating distributor cam in there and that's how we adjust the timing. Okay, we're here with the pump now. So I got a vacuum pump on this and we're going to pump it up. And you can watch the breaker point plate change. So I'm going to release the vacuum on here and you can see it go back. So that's how we used to control the ignition timing relative to engine load on, on a lot of cars for many years until things become computerized and the computer now controls that. Now there's another advanced mechanism in there called centrifugal advance. So let's go look at that one. Now it's hard to see in this one because the centrifugal advance is buried underneath, but underneath attached to this shaft is some special weights and springs. So when the RPM picks up high enough, the weights will fly out and it too will cause the the shaft in, to change its relative position right here. You can see that I, when I move that shaft, it actually causes the shaft to advance the position of the rotor that's attached to it and there's spring loaded so it comes back. So as RPM increases, the centrifugal force exerted on the weights on that distributor shaft will change the timing. We want our ignition timing when the spark occurs to occur early at high RPM because the pistons are moving faster. So we have to fire it earlier so we can get the full burn of the fuel on the power stroke. So mechanical advance uses weights and RPM to change the when the spark occurs and vacuum advance uses a vacuum diaphragm unit sensitive to the intake manifold vacuum. Now these distributors were rotated by the camshaft. So on the bottom of the camshaft was a camshaft gear and as and that camshaft gear is called the accessory drive gear. And distributors many times as well have a special lug on the bottom that drives the oil pump below. Now these shafts turned at one half the speed of the crankshaft, so our distributor also turns half the speed of the crankshaft. Makes sense, four stroke engine. We only fire our spark lugs every second engine revolution. And that's essentially the parts of a distributor. Now I wanted to show you a car that actually had centrifugal advance weights on it. So you can see when the car goes, spins really quick, what's gonna happen is those weights are gonna wanna fly out and it's gonna change the relative position of the rotor in respect to the rotation of the distributor shaft, causing the rotor to advance a little bit and causing the spark to occur slightly earlier so we can ensure complete combustion in the cylinders. I'll show you this earlier is a condenser on the distributor and of course their breaker points look a little different on this model but they're they're in there as well they're tucked in a little bit deeper now as cars got newer we went away from mechanical switches to turn the ignition coil on and off and we we ended up with something that is electronic so what we switched to is a little magnetic switching device and inside of distributors we have a little little trigger wheel. Now this is bent and first I can't, ro can't rotate it very well, but, and by the way, we call this the pickup coil, not to be confused with the ignition coil, and that is the armature. Now you can see inside of this distributor, electronic ignition distributor, and I've just got the center part and the plate that uh, goes into the main distributor. You can see the armature teeth on here, and you can see the magnetic pickup here in the coil inside of that. Now, as this magnetic pickup sits stationary in the rotating armature, which have, that's really a rotating conductor, passes by the magnetic field in the end of the pickup, it's going to disrupt the magnetic field slightly, changing the intensity of the magnetic field. And by doing so, it's going to induce an alternating current in that little coil, 
which is then sent through these wires to the ignition module, which then triggers the ignition coil. Simple as that. So every time one of those teeth lines up, we get a spark plug firing. Missile lines, it charges the coil, fires the coil. Charges the coil, fires the coil. Now, it was pretty important that these wires remain intact, and what happens sometimes is those wires would break internally, and if they did, our ignition system would fail. So what we could do is go inside with an ohm meter and we could test the integrity of those windings. Now talking about ignition modules, here's a Ford ignition module. And inside of that ignition module was a series of transistorized circuits, but it amplifies the signal from the pickup from the center of the distributor, and it can then command the coil on and off. Now Chevrolet had a different style of of ignition module. Chevrolet like to put their ignition module right in the middle of their distributor. They put it all in one unit. Now I don't have the rotor on here. You can see the on this one, the mechanical weights that are responsible for, or one of them, one is missing on it. But you can see the, the weights on top, the centrifugal weights for mechanical advance. But underneath here, that is the ignition module. And in the middle of it, there's that little, what we call the timer core and pole piece, which is essentially the pickup pickup mechanism or pickup coil. And it would send two wires to the module, a little transistorized circuit would then command the be sent to the coil to turn the coil on and off. Now, we're gonna start with a breaker point ignition because it really kind of tells me about how we shut off this ignition coil, turn it back on to create a high voltage spike enough to fire spark plugs. So in older cars, we had a breaker point switch inside of the distributor. On newer cars, we use an electronic uh, pickup coil and armature to do the same thing, and we'll get to that in a moment. But how it essentially works is this. When we turn the key on in our car, we send power from the battery through the ignition switch. On older cars, we had a special resistor called a ballast resistor. That brought the voltage down from 12.6 to 14.8 volts. That was the range that operated when the car was running. Stepped it down to 9.5 volts. So it would come into what we call the primary coil inside of the, inside of the ignition coil. And it would run through that wire called a primary wire up into the distributor to a little switch called the breaker points. Now the breaker points main responsibility was this. It took this side of the coil and it grounded it. Now when the switch closed and when the distributor would rotate, the distributor cam, which had lobes on it, would open and close that little switch in there called the breaker point switch. There's a little rubbing block on there that would make it go open and close. When the switch was closed, it grounded that side of the circuit, completing the circuit, creating a magnetic field. So breaker points, I want you to remember that switch. Now when the coil had its ground, it would build up a magnetic field. And the magnetic field, instantly when it would go on, would create an induced voltage into the secondary wind. Now one thing about transformers, when you have a transformer, with two, it has basically essentially a primary winding and secondary winding, you have a ratio set up between the two windings. Now the magnetic field carries across into the secondary winding. And the neat thing about electricity and conductors, if you take a winding or any conductor and you run a magnetic field by that conductor, you're gonna induce voltage into the conductor. We're going to use the magnetic field of the primary coil to create a magnetic field in the secondary coil and 
because there's more windings in the secondary coil, we're gonna get more voltage out of it. So we're gonna actually take a ratio here of 100 windings on the primary winding, approximately 10,000 windings on the secondary uh, winding, and we're gonna be able to amplify voltage accordingly. So if we put in initially, let's say 9.5 volts in, we're gonna get 100 times the voltage out of it. So just turning the key on, we step from 9.5 volts up to 950 volts to the secondary winding. Now, that's not enough to make it fire yet. It's just gonna get an initial surge up to 950 volts. And if we didn't do anything, that voltage would quickly peter down. But as long as the distributor is rotating, making a magnetic field and breaking a magnetic field, something interesting happens. Like so when we send power traveling through this, that those electrons travel at their speed, we allow it to go to ground and we suddenly take the ground away by opening up the switch, we're gonna build a spike in voltage on the primary winding. So that, nine, that original uh, 9.5 volts on the primary side can climb to as high as 250 volts. Now, if you've got more windings in there, it'll climb even higher. But let's use that as an example. 9.5 to 250 on the primary side. What happens on the secondary side is also amplified. So now we will climb on the secondary side 100 times that of the primary side. So that will bring us up to 25,000 volts on the secondary side every time we open up that ignition point. And, and that's how the ignition system works. Let's look at what's happening over here. We've now got electronic ignition. We've added a magnetic pickup coil, which is actually an alternating current generator. So it's a little AC generator. And we've also added an ignition module. The ignition module has a transistor inside. Actually, it's got multiple transistors inside, but we can explain what's happening with just one. Now the transistor is a solid state switch. It has no moving parts, but it's really interesting. It kind of acts like a relay. Here's what's going to happen when we turn the distributor, we're going to create a little AC signal. When the alternating current signal is sent down into the base of the transistor, we have an emitter collector in the base, we will trigger that transistor to turn on and off. When we have the armature teeth on the distributor shaft aligning with the pickup coil, we're actually going to create a little change in, in voltage. It's gonna have a little voltage spike rising and falling. When the voltage spikes, what's gonna happen is we're gonna reverse the flow of current into the base circuit, shutting off the base circuit. Now, one thing about transistors, if we have no current flowing from the emitter down to the base circuit, through the pickup coil windings, we will shut down the transistor and disconnect the coil. When we allow the armature teeth to misalign with the pole piece, what happens is we allow a path of current flow through the transistor, through the little windings in the transistor, making our way to ground. And that will switch on the transistor, and in turn, it will allow a path of power to run down from the primary field windings of the ignition coil down to the ground from the emitter to the collector circuit turning on the ignition coil. Now, remember, we want ignition coils to fire, we actually have to take the power away, and it's that sudden uh, reversal, removal of power, and the collapse of the magnetic field that's gonna cause the ignition coil to fire. So once more, once we realign the armature's teeth with the pickup coil, we cause a reversal in voltage up here, and that's the same as essentially cutting off the base circuit we cut off the base circuit, we collapse the magnetic field by taking away the power of the primary windings, and we get a spark being released to the distributor out through the rotor, which finds its way out to the spark plugs. And that's how an electronic ignition system works. And no moving switch in that system, just everything is solid state. 
Well, what about coilover plug or distributorless ignition systems? Fundamentally, they work very similar to regular ignition systems that are electronic. They'll have an electronic control that's either in the electronic control module or a separate ignition module and they'll also use crankshaft sensors or camshaft sensors to trigger the circuit to then fire the ignition coil which is then sent to the spark plugs.